I got an invitation to speak, and it reads in part, we would offer you the latitude to speak on any topic, but would ask you to include one or more of the whole person dimensions of leadership, integrity, moral reasoning, and ethical decision making. And it didn't take long for me to realize there's a very uh, popular and current issue that uh, fits right in there, and it's the issue of bullying. Uh, we are living in a culture where bullying has taken a, a headline position uh, from our national news down to our local school districts and everywhere in between. It isn't leadership. Bullying is not leadership. It is actually dictatorship. It is tyranny. It is what breeds terrorism. Bullying is not integrity. It is dishonor. It is cruel. It is monstrosity when you take it to its full extent. Bullying is not moral reasoning at all. It is actually a reasoning that has abandoned morals. It is indecent and it is disrespectful of one's fellows. Bullying is not ethical as far as a decision-making process. It is inequitable, it is unjust, and it's distasteful. Bullying, like anything else that plagues society in general or a campus in specific, has both cause and consequence. There are reasons and results. And we want to examine that a little bit, correcting the consequences of bullying without dealing with the cause or even identifying the cause is similar to expecting to mask the symptoms of a disease without combating the germ that causes the disease. Bullying, as we evaluate it, could be narrowed down to three basic things. Now, anytime somebody comes to boil things down, your pot might boil it down slightly different than mine does, but just let's look at this pot this morning. I want to boil bullying down to three ways that we measure one another. In this cadet corps, in our society in general, even in our individual families, we measure ourselves and we measure other people. One of those ways we measure is by academic superiority as it is contrasted with what we consider an academic inferiority. And there is bullying that takes place on that scale. There is also athletic spirit, uh, superiority. And we measure ourselves and we measure other people around us on the basis of whether or not we have a certain athletic ability based on whether or not somebody else lacks that certain athletic ability. Then there is the aesthetic superiority. And this has to do with um, what we naturally would call handsome guys and pretty girls. And we measure people that way. And there's a lot of bullying that goes on because somebody does or does not possess a certain amount of aesthetic superiority. So with those three things in mind, I would say that as causes, they produce consequences. In the laws of physics, we learn that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. God has created the world in which we live, the whole creation in which we reside, to have physical laws that have spiritual law counterparts. Every spiritual law of the Bible has a physics law that illustrates it. We can see the law of physics in action with our senses. We can observe it, and that law then becomes the parable to illustrate a spiritual law. The law of cause and consequence, the laws of motion, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Every time someone engages in bullying, there is a consequence. So, what are some of those consequences? Well, some of them are the mental abuses.
that take place in a classroom. The derision that people experience in real life situations where they are interacting and they are either the bullier or the bully. And they are either the one giving out the snide remarks in the classroom or they're on the receiving end of those less than savory comments. There are physical abuses that take place. Some of these happen uh, perhaps in a locker room. Some of them happen perhaps in a hallway. And uh, again, these are the results of measuring people by academics, athletics, and aesthetics rather than measuring people by who they are as God created them. There have been in the headlines for now many months, uh, there has been a rash of sexual abuse claims, harassment, the devaluation of people based on these three things that I've talked about. All right? And then there are emotional abuses. All of these would contribute to emotional abuse. And the, the emotional abuse that we uh, experience sometimes produces that, that umbrella that we call drama. And we're all familiar with that. We have it in our families. We have it in classrooms. We have it in society. We have it at every strata of society. Acting out, attention seeking, even suicide, which now plagues our country in unprecedented proportions for the very reasons that I've given. Underneath all of this bullying is an inherent problem. The Bible identifies it. The inherent problem underneath all bullying is a little word, three letters long. It's the word sin. This world is a world in which people have been born into and then become choice-making people and they engage in sin. Underneath being bullied is of something else that's in society. It has been in every culture since Adam and Eve, and that is the desire for acceptance. Everybody in this room desires acceptance. And everybody in this room, probably if we could just have your life history uh, put up here on the screen, there would be some situation in which you were bullied. And there would be some situation in which you were the bullier. Just simply because it is our nature. I can look back to my school years and remember situations where I was being bullied. I remember situations where I'm sorry to admit and I'm ashamed to admit I was the bullier. I remember both of those. It's inherent in us. <clears throat> this yearning for acceptance is something I believe God has taken care of in the person of Jesus Christ. In the book of Ephesians, we could read these words, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So as he tells us that God has made a provision for all of mankind to possess not just physical blessings, but spiritual blessings. That would be favors that we can't necessarily see or hear or smell or taste or touch. They're spiritual in nature. And then God, through the Apostle Paul, begins to list out what some of those spiritual blessings or favors are. Notice, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, now notice these words, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. I want to focus on that phrase, accepted in the beloved. The passage goes on and lists several other spiritual blessings which include redemption and forgiveness and grace 
and God's abounding toward us, His wisdom, and on and on and on, many spiritual blessings. I want to focus on that phrase, accepted in the Beloved. You may be this morning bullied by somebody. You may be this morning bullied by many somebodies. I mentioned just a moment ago from my own uh, experience, I can remember being bullied. I am short, I'm small. I grew up on a dairy farm and uh, I carried milk and threw hay bales and, and you know engaged in unsavory chores around the farm. But I never really learned how to wrestle. I never really learned how to take somebody down that was twice my size. I wasn't a weakling. I just didn't really know how to apply it. So I became uh, kind of the, the butt of a lot of physical abuse in school. And uh, I remember walking down the hall and uh, having the, 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 the school bully knock all my books out of my hand and kick them down the hall and papers flying everywhere. I, that happened on many occasions. I remember one particular bully who happened to walk into the restroom when I was there and he uh, stuck my head in the jaw. I remember that. I remember things of that nature occurring. And I wanted acceptance, and God gave me, even before I was a believer in Him, a way to help people. And that was that even though I wasn't really uh, all physically able to defend myself, God gave me a pretty good mind. I graduated uh, high school third in my class of four people. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, third in my class. And um, I was able to help many of the students who bullied me in other situations to pass their classes. And I was able to sit in study halls. And even though I lived on a dairy farm and I needed my study halls to get my own homework done, I normally ended up helping other kids get their homework done so they could play basketball after school. And then I went home and did chores and did my homework at night and uh, got through that way. But anyway, back to the acceptance. Why was I so willing to help people academically who were so abusive to me in other ways. The yearning for acceptance. It's in all of us. And I can tell you today that when I came to Christ as my Savior, I found the ultimate acceptance. God accepted me on the basis of the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ shed for sinners and for sin. When you eliminate God from your worldview, what you're doing is dooming yourself to the ever-changing whims of acceptance among your peers. If you rule God out of your worldview, then you'll never know acceptance from God. And the only place you'll be able to find it is horizontal at the same level where you are in the creation order. When, however, you accept the Creator God into your worldview, you agree to the scriptural fact that the one who is the highest of all has made a provision for your acceptance. When we understand that we have acceptance from above, it makes acceptance down here less important. So the bullying has less effect on us. You and I will not be able to stop bullying. But we can do something about the way it affects us. When you're bullied in any given situation, academic, athletic, or aesthetic, you can't do anything about what's said. You can't do anything about what is done. But you can do so much about your reaction to it. You can do so much about the way you respond to it. And the first step is to accept the all-wise, almighty creator God into your worldview and find acceptance in Him through the blood of Jesus Christ. That acceptance in the Beloved is acceptance on God's part through the acceptable means that He has made. The atoning work, the redemption work, the forgiveness of the blood of Christ. 
when you understand that Jesus shed his blood at the cross to forgive you. And when you find that forgiveness, one of the worst burdens you will ever carry is wiped away. And that's the guilt of non-acceptance. God in the person of his only begotten son was willing to invest what was infinitely valuable to him, his own life and blood, to secure your salvation and provide acceptance into the family of God. This acceptance in the beloved is also an acceptance by others who have also found that acceptance. The glorious result is evaluation based on your value in God's sight. Now let me illustrate that this way. If you were to value the clothing that you're wearing this morning. You might say, what I'm wearing is worth $150. And I would be willing to pay $150 for what I'm wearing. Would you be willing to pay $5,000 for what you're wearing this morning? Probably not. It's not worth that to you. And when we understand what Jesus Christ was willing to pay, for us as individuals. It helps us understand our true value. My value today is not in where what I assess my value to be. You know, I can get up here and, and enlarge on the, uh, the resume that one of the cadets read about me. I could, I could go on and on and on and I could tell you all about myself. What would be the point of evaluating myself? You would walk out of here saying, wow, he's a conceited, arrogant man. Wow, he just thinks he is, you know, all that in a bag of chips. What would be the point of that? Some of you might find that a bit sickening. Perhaps you would rather hear my wife's evaluation of me. But then there would be some who would say, well, of course she's going to say that. She's his wife. But what about what God would be willing to invest. What about what he's willing to invest for everyone? He didn't say, Jeff Farnham, you're worth $150 to me. He didn't say, you're worth $5,000 to me. Here's what he said. You're worth my life. You're worth the blood that I will shed. And on the cross, he uttered these words, Father, what? Forgive them. For they know not what they do. And I will tell you that growing up in the home where I grew up, we had no church affiliation at all. I had no idea that Jesus had done that for me. But when I found that out, something changed in my life. Because I realized God was willing to invest his life, the life of his son. And you know what? It hasn't stopped bullying in my life. There are people that even to this day mock and ridicule and, and so, you know what? I find my value at a different level. And I want to challenge the young people in this room today. Whether you are in middle school or high school, whether you're graduating this year and you have grandiose plans and exciting hopes and dreams, or whether you're uh, an eighth grader and you're thinking, oh, four more years of this, how am I going to do Re Regardless of your status, and, and for you who are teachers and community members, we, we don't outgrow this, we call it peer pressure. We don't outgrow it. And everybody in this room knows somebody who measures him academically, athletically, or aesthetically in a negative light. We all know people that do that to us. I'll tell you, you can eliminate the effects of it when you find true acceptance in Jesus Christ. We may not see in our day the conclusion of bullying, but we can learn to control the consequences. I would close with a couple of scripture references. 1 Corinthians 15, 
and verse 57 says, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory is not limited to just a game. This is a military academy. And victory is associated with the military in every century, in every culture, in every age. Where is the real victory? Well, I have lived long enough to remember some of the people who came home from World War II, the so-called greatest generation. I have known many World War II veterans in my life. I was born 12 years after uh, V-Day in Europe. And so I knew many World War II veterans. And I understood the passion that they had for the United States of America, the passion they had for this American flag to which we just gave our allegiance yet again. I understood the passion they had. And I understood the excitement that they would relate when they talked about victory. Where is the real victory? It's in Jesus Christ. It is a spiritual victory. It is the victory that ministers to you inside when people are assaulting you from the outside. I would give you one other verse. Now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ. In Christ. Where is that triumph? It is in the person of Jesus Christ. For the bullying, for what you face, when somebody begins to measure you academically, put you down, mock you, ridicule you, measure you, and you go out of that classroom feeling defeated. You go out of that classroom feeling like, why bother? And discouragement sets in. When you are in a, a physical strength or physical coordination situation and you miss the ball and the teammates rag on you and you are the one that is ridiculed. When you look in the mirror, and I'm telling you this is a major issue in the United States of America today. All you have to do is look at the plastic surgery industry and realize what a huge issue aesthetics is in our culture. And you look in the mirror because somebody has mocked you or ridiculed you and you don't feel accepted. I want to turn you to acceptance in Jesus Christ. Because when you're accepted from above, the lack of it down here doesn't hurt as much. May God bless you and give you good days.